town manager to get the full board input on certain matters. Um, settlement discussions will continue this week. Uh, the first item on the agenda is always the citizens concerns, uh, issues that are not on our agenda tonight. Uh, you're welcome to bring up at the podium briefly. Briefly, you have citizens concerns. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Um, as usual, I am um, reporting on the number of town-owned cars in the lot. There are 10 tonight, 10 spaces that aren't, residents aren't able to use. There's an ongoing complaint that 17 Woodbury should be made into parking. I claim that the town-owned cars that are left overnight can be moved over to behind the fire station. Um, I'm also here to talk about the 40B manual that uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals through town staff has recommended the 40B manual that does not mention the um, historic, the process of protecting the historic buildings. So that, and it also doesn't mention getting the pro formas, which we're supposed to be getting under law. So I would like that. I didn't write an email on that one. I did write an email about the security cameras in the library, and I didn't get a response. Um, but I'd like to know what other buildings, I'd like to know where the cameras are, I'd like to know the policy, who gets the data, when the public is able to weigh in on when the public hearings are relative to, you know, effectively public scrutiny of... of uh, can I ask you, Tara, how many yes. other, other issues you have? Because there's some information we can provide right now with regard to security cameras, but I don't want to um, have, you know, 20 issues and, you know, two-minute information responses because that will cut into our time. Yes, I understand that. You asked me to send emails, and I'm following up on an email that I didn't get a response Yeah, and on. I actually was asking the town manager about that. I, okay. It's my understanding That's that fine. the cameras are at the library and at the public safety facility. Mm -hmm. um, I, I gather the town manager knows a little bit more about this, but I gather there's some security issues at the library. I don't know if it's theft or, or what is going on. And it's possible that we'll need security com cameras elsewhere in town. Mr. Manager, you have anything I, I to add? I do not want to comment about security issues. Okay. Well, I'd okay. like then to have some kind of public hearing on the matter um, to get, we don't know, um, we don't want to comment, you know, kind of, it, it's not the first time I've asked about it, so I'd like very much to get some information on that. Um, and then the last thing was the parking hearing for West Act, and I put an email in and didn't get a response on that, just hoping to get something going on that this fall. Okay, thank you. No, so I you, know. you got my email on that? Yes, I, okay, I have. I, at, at some point, yeah, I try to respond to emails, but honestly, uh, when they come in fast and furious, I miss some. So. That's okay. I just want confirmation that you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Bob Miller, 84 Windsor Avenue. Uh, I wanted to thank the board on behalf of Windsor Avenue residents for the letter sent on the monopole to the Governor Baker and to MWRA. Uh, I've heard from uh, Representative Benson's office and uh, also... Corey Atkins office saying that she's been in touch with you and I was wondering if there's any feedback that you got or the name new information um, I actually owe a call to representative Atkins because she did call me and I haven't gotten back to her and I haven't I haven't talked to Jen Benson or Senator Eldridge's office sent an email acknowledging um, an email that I'd send on behalf of the board to the three um, state rep group but um, yeah I haven't heard anything. Uh, if I do hear anything, I certainly would share that. So thank you, Mr. Miller. Anybody else? All right. Quickly, uh, Chairman's update. Um, there was a special Board of Selectmen meeting uh, last Thursday um, at 7 o'clock in the morning to hear from the Concord-based developer Adam Wynn Stanley about potential plans for the redevelopment of the Kmart site, uh, which would include a mix potentially of retail offices and apartments, maybe about 130 apartments, including 10% affordable. Very preliminary plan. It would exclude, at this point, it excludes the Verizon property and also the Baker Whitney Oil Company property. Um, wouldn't start for a number of years uh, after the current Kmart lease expires. Um, uh, the plan also contemplates town meeting approval of amended zoning to authorize master planning, the master planning process that was, that was the subject of uh, the attempted uh, zoning amendment that failed, I think, I forget how long ago it was, but anyhow, the master planning process would allow for redevelopment of 
larger parcels of which there are really only three in the Kelly's Corner area and with the Kmart parcel being the one where there's clearly interest in redevelopment. Um, but the master planning process would allow town representatives to work with the developer and have substantial town input at every step, including on design issues. Um, the project could move forward at the same time or even a bit earlier than the infrastructure improvement project that is on the list for federal and state funding. Um, I will be standing in for Ms. Green later this week at a meeting of the town manager, Green Act, Green Act and representatives with the council to discuss pot a potential anti-gas leaks law. Uh, future agenda items, uh, the town manager annual contract, probably we will talk about that on uh, at our meeting on the 7th, finalize the terms of the amended contract and also vote in public session to approve. Um, the proposed slate for the West Acton Sewer Committee um, will be on August 7th. I was hoping, hoping to finish screening candidates in time to get it on to tonight's agenda, but it, that didn't happen. Um, we currently are planning only the one meeting on August 7th, um, though obviously that could change and often in many years it does. Mr. Manager. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're still moving uh, forward on implementing electric aggregation towards the end of September. We're working with the consultant on uh, public relation issues, which will include television show, reverse 911, mailings, um, and, and things like that. Um, we, uh, there are two new fire employees that are now going through their physical uh, tests. We've had some turnover in fire due to promotions, retirements, uh, things like that. Uh, we still have not uh, uh, commenced advanced life support because the state has not finalized or approved our final regulations that uh, the department has put in. But So we're still kind of uh, working with SMURA, but uh, hopefully that will be resolved relatively soon. Um, We've hired a new police officer in the, in, in the police department that will bring us up to a full complement. It's Officer Ryan Matty, who um, uh, graduated the Reading Police Academy program, uh, has been a reserve officer with the Dudley Police Department, and uh, holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Worcester State. And um, I think that's about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, our origi original 710 schedule for today had a hearing and it's being been continued. Um, I guess I'll read the notice because it, it's on the agenda and then we'll just uh, note that it's going to be continued. The Acting Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on July 24, 2017, continued for May 8, 2017 at 7.10 p.m. in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room 204 at the Town Hall, 472 Main Street Act, and on the application of 145 Great Road LLC for an amendment of site plan with special permit 7-25-00-372 under zoning bylaw section 10.4. The applicant requests a change in the condition on delivery times at Brookside Chops, 145 Great Road. The application can be inspected at the planning department in town hall during normal business hours. As I said, the applicant's attorney has requested a continuation to August 7, uh, 2017 at 7.50 p.m. And do we need an approval of that or? Just done. <laughs> so if anybody came for that, they, I hope they read the agenda and saw that it's been continued. So what we do have on for 710 is fire station needs assessment presentation. And I think our chief is here. Right. Uh, but by way of introduction, um, I'd like to introduce Peter Finley from uh, Municipal Resources, uh, the consultant we have hired. Um, and and, and what, what prompted us to hire the consultant and, and, and so the issue is one, we, you know, we obviously understand there, there, there is a lot of uh, coverage issues for North Acton. Also, as, as we've been going through the capital planning process and looking at our space needs study we had done a few years ago, uh, we, you know, we realize our three existing stations are not in the best of shape. And in my mind, some of the questions were, are, are these stations adequate? You know, clearly they were, they were built, and Peter will go through this, you know, back in a time where, where the town was significantly smaller, so they may not be in the correct places, et cetera. So we hired MRI to look at the, look at the situation and, and, and to make a report and give us some recommendations. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Peter Finley to um, make a presentation. Peter?
Thank you, Mr. Ledoux. And members of the board, uh, Mr. Ledoux, Chief Hart, um, on behalf of MRI, I wanted to uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to perform this study and assessment for you, and also giving me the opportunity to come here tonight and kind of give you an overview of what our findings were. So we'll, we'll run through a PowerPoint. Uh, to kind of as way of introduction, um, Municipal Resources is a New Hampshire-based uh, company that specializes in uh, providing consulting and other types of services to municipal governments throughout New England and throughout the Northeast. They've been in business for 28 years now and, and have literally done hundreds of fire department type studies, public safety studies, those sort of things. I spent more than 30 years in the fire service in New Jersey. That's why I probably talk a little bit funny to, to people up here, uh, my accent. So I'll try and speak slowly. Um, but anyway, um, so I have a lot of experience in, in that area, as do all of the people who work for municipal resources. So we were asked by the town to come in and do a fire station needs assessment. And it, it really was a two-prong study. Uh, part one of it was to look at the existing fire stations and evaluate them for their condition and their, their suitability, that sort of thing. And then the second part of it was to kind of look at the North Acton area, which is an area where there's been tremendous growth over the years, but it seems to be an area that, that's somewhat underserved as far as the, the, the emergency services, fire, and EMS. So, we basically completed a number of tasks um, as part of this project. We did a site visit to the town, toured the community with the chief. Um, big one is we coordinated with personnel from the town's geographic information systems uh, provider. What they did was the Acton Fire Department, Chief Hart and, and his personnel provided us with run data statistics for every incident that had occurred in Acton over a five-year period. And that was from December the 7th, 2011 through December the 7th, 2016. And in conjunction with the, the uh, GIS personnel, we were able to not only extract statistics that showed average response times, long response times, those sort of things, but they were able to plot every one of those incidents on maps of Acton. So we could see where all of the incidents were occurring. And you'll see a few of them in, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we did a tour and an inspection of the existing Acton stations. Um, we did interviews with uh, town administrator, or excuse me, town manager, members of the fire department, some other key stakeholders. Uh, we did a statistical review and analysis. We talked about that. And then we also looked at some potential locations for a fourth station in North Acton. So as a result of the analysis that we did, we kind of came up with two major concerns. The first one is that the existing stations um, the, the three existing stations in Acton are older and they no longer effectively or efficiently meet the needs of the fire department that has an expanding mission in, in a community that is still growing. All right. So, so the existing stations really need to either be upgraded or eventually replaced. And then the second part of it is the fire and EMS coverage in North Acton is lacking. There's significant development that's occurring or has occurred in that area. It's still occurring. And as a result, more and more incidents are occurring in that area. Also because the closest fire station is the one that's right across the street here in central Acton, the response times are longer than they are in other parts of the town. And actually, um, in some cases, or in a lot of cases, they actually exceed some of the recommended benchmarks that we'll talk about in just a minute. So the existing stations, we'll talk about them just briefly first. Um, they're minimally act adequate for the current staffing apparatus and equipment. Can they still function? Yes, they do every day and they still serve the town. But they don't allow for the best deployment of various department resources. They're small and cramped and they lack a lot of modern day safety features. For instance, if you look at this middle picture here, all right, the ceiling here is very, very low in that facility. That limits the height 
of the apparatus that can be stored in there. The firefighters can't work on top of these vehicles while they're in the station. The ladder truck, and this is the uh, central station right across the street, the ladder truck can't be located in this station because it literally won't fit. Um, look at the, the, this is the line where the apparatus parks on. There's very, very little space between there and where the firefighters keep their gear and equipment. This photo shows it even better. So the, the stations really have, have, they were designed for different apparatus in a different era. They lack a lot of modern day safety features. They don't have fire alarm systems. They don't have sprinkler systems. Um, you know, they're, they're not ADA compliant. They, they don't comply with a lot of the current day recommendations from the National Fire Protection Associations for things that fire stations should have for safety, for security, for uh, infection control those sort of things that, that, are, that are real hot button issues today. So really, with the existing stations, the fire department in conjunction with the town leadership, um, with the board through town meeting, um, you know, should develop a long-term capital improvement plan for all of the department's existing facilities, um, including possible significant upgrades or an expansion or replacement of the central station. Um, you know, if, if the department was deployed in the best possible way, the central station would be where the ladder truck is, it would be where the shift commander is, but there just is not the room there to deploy those resources from there. So when we talk about deploying the, the resources of the department, and we're kind of going to transition from the existing stations now into the need in North Acton, there's a couple of things that we want to kind of go over to give you some perspective or some background before we talk about what we found and what our recommendations are. All right, first of all, the expectations for the quality and quantity of fire and EMS services come from the residents and the taxpayers. All right, you know, it's up to the residents of the community to decide what level of, of protection they want, what level of risk they're willing to take, and then it's the board who has to translate that expectation or, or that requirement into reality. But the, the appropriate deployment of resources is very critical to the ability of the fire department to effectively, efficiently, and safely fulfill its core public safety missions, which is to provide fire and emergency medical services to the 911 caller in the quickest manner possible. So from the perspective of stations and apparatus, there's three main factors that are generally used to help determine the deployment of resources. All right, response time. How long does it take from the time a 911 call or a person picks up the phone and dials 911 until a trained emergency responder arrives on location? All right. Travel distance. How long does the, the ambulance, does the fire truck, uh, whatever, have to travel to get to that scene? And of course, travel distance is going to directly impact response time. The longer the travel distance, the greater the response time. And then call volume. You know, how busy is the department? How often do they experience simultaneous or, or multiple calls at the same time? Those sort of things. Of the three, of the three, response time is the most critical for both fire and emergency medical incidents. All right? Why? Well, from EMS standpoint, for people who are having medical emergencies, irreversible brain damage can occur if the brain is deprived of oxygen for more than four minutes. All right? So a person that's, that's having a cardiac emergency, that's having a respiratory emergency, that's having a, a stroke, those sort of things, the longer the, the body or the brain is deprived of its full oxygen supply, all right, the more the brain damage is going to occur. And beyond four minutes, a lot of times it becomes irreversible. The potential for su successful resuscitation during cardiac arrest decreases exponentially with each passing minute that CPR or cardiac defibrillation is delayed. The standard of care in Massachusetts is to have a, a unit on the scene, and it's pretty much national, it's not just Massachusetts, within four to six minutes of the time that the 911 caller dialed 911 to have someone there who can initiate CPR and or with a defibrillator that can start administering definitive care. For fires, fires can double in size and intensity every 30 seconds. 
All right? And there's a phenomenon called flashover, which is when a fire is developing in a confined space, that basically what happens is the fire gets to a point where everything in that area ignites almost simultaneously. All right, that can occur within five to seven minutes of fire ignition, um, and it's one of the most dangerous events that either a firefighter or civilians who may be trapped can, can experience. All right, for firefighters or civilians, if you're caught in a flashover, it's a non-survivable event. All right, but it also significantly increases the resources that the fire department is going to need to, to handle that incident. So the goal of the fire department is to arrive on the scene of a structure fire and, and gain control of that situation before flashover occurs. So that's kind of the, the, the broad perspective of how we look at our response times. Okay. So there's a couple of other things that we look at also. The Insurance Services Office, also known as ISO, has what they call their fire service uh, rating system, uh, a deployment coverage model. But what they recommend is that an engine company should be within one and a half mile travel distance of every location within their response area, and a ladder company should be within two and a half miles. Now, that's the traditional method of, of determining the placement of fire stations. Um, and it also is um, part of what determines insurance rates that people may be paying in the community. Insurance companies look at the, the ISO rating, uh, which can be from one to 10, and say, you know, for instance, if, uh, what, what is that, Chief? Do you? I believe it's four. Four, okay, which is a, which is a pretty good number. Um, People who are at a place like Acton, if they have a four, the insurance rates would be expected to be less than a place that has a six. Okay. Um, the National Fire Protection Association also comes up with standards or, or issues standards um, that are the national consensus standards. Okay. Um, NFPA 1710, standard 1710, is for the deployment of career fire departments. And what they state is that the first arriving engine company um, should arrive at the scene of a fire suppression incident within four minutes or less. And that four minutes starts when the wheels are rolling on the apparatus. There's an extra minute for the call to be received at the 911 center, and then there's a minute for the companies to be dispatched to get on the apparatus. So once the wheels are rolling, we'd like to have someone there within four minutes. For EMS incidents, uh, they recommend that a unit with first responder or higher trained personnel and with um, a defibrillator arrive on the scene within four minutes, and an advanced life support unit, a paramedic unit, arrive within eight minutes. Okay. And both of those benchmarks are 90%. So they want you to uh, try and achieve that 90% of the time. So now we move in to what we have seen in Acton. All right? The fire department's deployment, at least from the perspective of station locations, is basically unchanged since the early 1960s. Those stations were designed, I think the newest one was built in 1961 or 62. Um, it, it was a much different community. In 1960, the population of Acton was 7,238 people. In 2017, it's 21,944. So the community's population has tripled over those 57 years, um, but yet the fire department is still responding from the same stations and locations as they were then. Um, so the town has grown significantly, and much of that development is occurring in the North Acton area. Not exclusive, but, but the, the vast majority of it. Okay. So if we look at the graph at the bottom here, all right, this is how the town's fire districts look right now. So this is District 1. This is Station 1 right here, which is right across the street from where we're at. This is District 2, Station 2 is right there, and this is District 3 with Station 3 right here. So if you, if you look at the size of the districts, District 1 is much, much larger than the other two districts, and the station is located at one end of it. So you have a long travel distance to get to, to incidents in this area up here. All right? So if you also look at the responses, during the time that we looked at, 
did the fire department responded to 12,494 incidents, which is just about 2,500 a year, so about seven a day, just under seven a day. District 1, which is the district here, all right, that we're talking about, which would be really, and you'll see in, in the next slide, what would be District 1 and 4 if the new station were built, responded to 6,599 of those incidents, double what the next busiest district did. So this district is, is much, much busier than the other two. Again, in large part because of the number of incidents that it's responding to in the North Acton area. Okay. So if we broke District 1 into two parts, which we've done here, all right, so this would be District 1 now, okay, and this would be a new District 4 where a new fire station in North Acton would, would cover, all right? The actual district in North Acton would actually be busier than the existing District 1 by about 400 calls a year or so, on average. And that, that would be over the last five years. So it would still be the busiest district in the entire town. If you look at this, this is one of the, the maps that was developed in conjunction with the GIS personnel where all of the incidents are plotted on the map. All right, so that shows the location of every one of those 12,494 incidents. But what I want you to really look at is the map that's down here in the lower right hand corner. The areas that are purple here, and you'll see them kind of spread dispersed throughout the town, but you'll see a pretty heavy run of them right along here, which happens to be right along Route 2A, all right? That's what we call, this is what we call a heat or a bleed map. And that shows, those purple areas show areas that are hot spots or where there's a heavy percentage or high incident activity, all right? So the biggest area where there's heavy incident activity in the entire town, the largest area is right down along Route 2A and along Route 27, right? which would all be in that new fire district four. Okay. We talked about the response time from, from when the apparatus wheels are actually moving. Okay, so our goal is to get a unit, get the first unit on location within four minutes of the time their wheels start rolling. Okay, so if you look at this map here, all right, areas that are in green, okay, are areas where the response time is about two minutes or less. Okay, you can see they're kind of uh, focused or, or grouped around where the fire stations are. The areas that are in yellow, all right, the response times are generally three to four minutes, less than four minutes, okay? So again, that takes care of a lot of the areas in the older portions of town. And the areas that are green and the areas that are yellow are areas that were meeting that four minute response time for the most part, okay? When we get into the areas that are orange, all right, there's a little patch there, a little patch there, but again, most of them are up in North Acton, right? Now we're looking at response times that are five to six minutes in duration, and when we get into these red areas, which are on the far edges of North Acton, we're looking at response times that are eight minutes and above. Okay. So, using the data that we got from the, um, from the fire department and utilizing an anticipated response speed average of about 35 miles an hour, that the GIS people were able to come up with some projections. So right now, the average, the current District 1 uh, overall response time is about four minutes for all incidents, right? But that's higher than the Acton average, which is about 3.4 minutes when you count Districts 2 and 3. But the area of North Acton that, that is lacking a station right now, it's 4.9 minutes, so it's just under five minutes. Putting a station up there, and we'll talk about the 4A and 4B in, in just a minute, reduces that time 
projected drive time by two minutes, from about 4.9 minutes on average to 2.9 minutes on average. So we're saving two minutes on average to most calls in North Acton. So as we looked at potential locations for a, a station in North Acton, there, there were basically two possibilities that we looked at. Station 4A is this one right here. All right, that's right by the ball fields at Route 27 and 2A. All right, the other site is in the vicinity of 6668 Harris Road. It's the old fish and wildlife facility. And apparently that had just come available when we were here in, in January and, and did the field work. <clears throat> so that's what we listed as station 4B. And we actually believe that that's probably the better of the two locations. Um, it, it's more centrally located in the district. Th this station here, as you can see, is not that far from what would be the district border, whereas this is more centrally located and more central to the real heavy development that's going on there. Um, and in the, the management letter that we did, we talk about some of the other pros and cons of, of the sites. But this is, this is a map that, that I think really, really illustrates the benefits of, of having a station up there. And we used the station 4B, the Harris Street location. So this was the map we looked at before with the, the situation with response times as it is today. So remember, orange is five to six minute response times, red is response times of greater than eight minutes. So this is the current situation. If you built the new station on Harris Road, all of this orange and all of this red goes away. So we have a large area up here again where we're going to have responses that are two minutes or less, but most of the rest of this area, we're now going to have response times of four minutes or less. Okay? We still have a little area over here um, where we're not going to be able to improve that. But again, everything is 90%. You can't get to everybody and, and areas where there's low incidence necessarily within those time frames. So what are our recommendations? All right. Well, we think the big one is that the town should move forward with the process of designing, financing, and constructing a new fire station in the North Acton area. Um, we think that the location on Harris Street is a preferred location for the station. We think there's a lot of benefits to that um, that, that make it a better location in the 2A and, and 27 location. Um, the other part of, of that long-term capital planning is that the town should give serious consideration to even or either expanding and significantly upgrading or replacing the existing uh, Acton Center station to allow it to accommodate the redeployment of the ladder truck set, uh, shift commander to a more central location in a town. That way they can go both ways and have a quick response time going both ways. So what will that do? Okay, why, why should the town make that investment? All right, well, taking collectively those recommendations will eliminate the existing service gaps in the North Acton area. All right, it's going to reduce travel distances and ultimately response times to uh, incidents in North Acton, potentially saving lives during serious medical emergencies, and certainly reducing property damage during fire incidents. Um, you'll be able to achieve a normal first unit on scene response time of six minutes or, or under, so four minutes of drive time to nearly the entire town. All right. um, you'll be able to, we think, get close, if not fully achieve, compliance with NFPA 1710, their benchmark standard for the on scene response time, which is four minutes from, from wheels turning, um, and then allow the, the redeployment of the ladder and shift commander to the centrally located Acton Center Station. Um, long term, and we're talking about five. 10 years down the road, maybe even longer, the department could consider going back to a three, uh, a reconfigured three station deployment uh, by decommissioning the West Acton station. And before, before people start to, to get upset, like I said, this is a long way in the future. And as the next 
recommendation says before a decision is made, you know, you should conduct additional in-depth analysis of the potential implications. Um, most up-to-date data is utilized. Um, you know, a lot of things can change in 10 years. The equation could change over that time. But if, if, if things remain the same, that might be an option that the town could consider down the road. So what's the challenge ahead for the town? Right? Determining that acceptable level of risk. Okay? So there's really three questions that need to be asked. You know, how much do we need? Okay? How much fire protection do we need? Well, I think that the data shows that a station is needed in North Acton. All right? How much can we afford? Well, that's always a question that people grapple with in, in this day and age. Um, but, you, you know, again, there's, there's a trade-off there. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in just a second. And then how should these resources be positioned and deployed to provide maximum benefit to the community? And again, we think that getting a station in North Acton and then doing something with the central station so that the ladder, the ship commander can run out of there are going to certainly provide increased benefits to the community. So there's a constantly changing level that's based on the express needs of the community. Okay, you know, the, what do the people of Acton expect when they pick the telephone up and call 911? Um, and as we said, it's the responsibility of the elected officials, the board, to translate community needs into reality. Okay. So, you know, one of the things when we talk about the dollars and cents, you know, the matching the needs of the community to fiscal ability. Okay. But Acton is the 35th highest income place to live in the United States with a population over 10,000. And, and I think this is really significant. One of the top 20 best places to live, I believe, three times in the last five or, or six years. That says something about the community. That says something about um, the, the people who live here. I'm sure it's because there's an outstanding school system. I'm sure it's because the town is well run, because um, the, the community provides the best services. So it would seem to translate that the people would want the best fire and EMS services, and, and getting Acton in, or North Acton in place would certainly improve that. And then, you know, translating the studies, evaluations, and recommendations into realities. I think this is the sixth study that has been done on the possibility or the need for that North Acton station since probably the 1970s. So, you know, trying to take all of that information and translate it from possibilities, um, you know, projections, and actually translate it into reality that will improve that service level up in North Acton. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Finley. The, the way it works here is I first open it up to the board to ask questions and make comments, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, I would say, first of all, about your accent. I heard you talk, and I thought, Philadelphia, because I, I, I lived and worked in Philadelphia for a number of years, and I have in-laws, my, my husband's sister and her kids live in Philadelphia, so, and they picked it up. And uh, when I was working in Philadelphia, I actually ran into a guy who had an, a Boston accent you could, so thick you could cut with a knife, and he'd been in Philly for 30 plus years. He said, yeah, you could take the boy out of Boston, but you can't take the Boston out of the boy. So anyhow, so you must get... <laughs> Well, and you're very perceptive. Um, my parents were both born and raised in Philly. I was, I was born in Philadelphia and still live about 30 miles outside the city now. There, there you have it. It was very nice when I was there. But um, let me open it up. Thank you very much. Uh, I haven't seen the prior studies, but I have to say that I really found this study to be very helpful. I'm co-chairing the, the newly formed Capital Improvement and Planning Committee, and one of the first things that our group did was visit the three fire stations. So we know up close and personal what the conditions are there and can vouch for the fact that they need help. So um, in any event, thank you very much for the study. I think it was, it was very thorough. And now... Thank you. Board members, Katie. Sure, I'll start by just um, echoing Janet's thanks. I, I thought it was a really um, thorough and, and easy to digest um, report, so I really appreciated that. I was a little worried going into it that it would be a lot, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, a lot denser, and, and it wasn't. It, it was very easy to understand and, and very clear in, in how you came to your conclusions. Um, so I just had a couple questions. Um, in the report and tonight, you mentioned one of your steps was interviewing 
uh, staff, both um, in the town and, and in the fire department about um, the current stations and all of that. And I was wondering if in the fire department, were you mostly interviewing sort of the fire leadership or were you also talking to um, some of the, the I don't want to say like lower level, you know, rank, 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 and rank and file, rank and file firefighters, file. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, just, um, we, we just interviewed the leadership okay. of the fire department, um, you know, because we felt that, I mean, you know, we talked informally sure. with the, the, the firefighters that were on duty the day that we went around, um, but, you know, a, a lot of the stuff was very intuitive Obvious. exactly um, <laughs> yeah. and and you know usually firefighters are not going to complain if they're going to get a new station or get an upgraded station that sort of thing no and i toured the fire departments when i first uh, was elected to the board and they definitely uh, it's it's clear the the sort of existing needs there um just both you know i i think you outline a, a lot of the needs in terms of the functions but also just in terms of the people working and and for many hours essentially living there so mm -hmm. um and then i had a question Question that might also be better for the chief, but I think it was mentioned in the report, um, Chief Hart, that you felt like if we opened a fourth fire station, that you might be able to um, sort of redeploy existing resources to cover um, all four fire stations with the same number of personnel that we currently have. And I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, because um, I think that's a big, you know, I mean, we can talk about the capital costs of building a new station, um, but then what are any associated kind of long-term costs with that? Sure, so currently uh, we operate on two, two personnel response or two people on each piece of equipment that leaves. So if we do go to four stations, we can fill that need with our current staffing level. So we, we aim for a 10 person shift, but we currently utilize a swing person to reduce over time, so we go down to nine. So we can still accomplish that. Okay. Um, it really stretches resources thin, sure. thinly, but and you know I'm not saying it's the best model. Right. But, but we can certainly accomplish that uh, and take baby steps, and as the community grows, add personnel right. as needed. Okay, but you don't think we would immediately need to add additional personnel? Correct. Okay, and do, would we have the same number of? Apparat, apparati <laughs> that we currently have. Yeah. <laughs> Deborah Zeck, I, I get the applause for my grammar person. <laughs> yes, we could do the same. Okay, great. Um, and then I just had a question um, about um, sort of if we internally have been looking at the costs for um, estimates for costs for some of these. Uh, immediate sort of safety concerns that were highlighted for the existing fire stations? Because I think it, you know, that was one of the um, uh, eye openers or, or things that really stuck out to me in this report is that, you know, the, the safety um, of, you know, not having sprinkler systems and adequate you know, carbon monoxide detectors and things like that and in our fire stations, you know, when we, we try to encourage people to have them in our homes and all of that is is concerning. And obviously we, you know, we had a fire recently in one of our, our trucks and so making sure that our firefighters are protected seems to be, um, you know, of utmost importance. So I just was wondering if, if we would kind of looked at what those costs are and how we can uh, address those quicker than some of these long-term issues. Our space needs study looked at all three existing buildings mm -hmm. and came up with some recommendations. Uh, I mean, they're pretty significant numbers, obviously. I don't yeah. remember what they are off the top of my head. But, you know, that's one of the reasons the Capital Planning Committee had, had done a tour, was to get a, get a feel of, of those buildings. So, uh, as Peter said, I mean, some of these things are going to have to figure out, for example, with the center. Uh, the center station um, needs a lot of work, but it may need either some kind of addition or mm -hmm. some other kind of work if we want to put a la the ladder truck up there. So that wasn't taken into account when we did the space needs study. Right, okay. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile to at least look into for the, the South and West Acton ones, probably addressing those sooner rather than later. Um, and that was my final question, was just sort of about next steps and where this goes with the, um, I assume goes back to the Capital Improvement Committee and, and gets taken into larger account with them or you know how how we, move forward from here with these recommendations? Well, I, I think that, uh, what, I guess, a couple of things. I, you know, definitely the Capital Improvement um, Planning Committee needs to be intimately involved with this. Um, I think that, you know, we'd like to get some direction from the board to kind of pursue 
the north uh, the north station look at uh, maybe uh, uh, looking at some preliminary design feasibility for example the Harris Street site uh, there is a gift fund from Avalon that probably has around a half a million dollars we can we could utilize to uh, to do some analysis of the site also um, a parcel adjacent to uh, to the Harris Street site 62 Harris Street which has a has an old uh, schoolhouse on it is for sale and uh, the owner has approached us um, it is possible that uh, we might want to pursue that um, use the schoolhouse for some kind of maybe fire administration and mm -hmm. give us a little more elbow room over there because if you remember we originally purchased Harris Street for the barn mm -hmm. in the back for for natural resources and I'd like to see how we could try to make everything work there if possible so uh, I guess what I'm looking for the board is, is just maybe giving us some direction to pursue uh, pursue the North Act and and, and, and maybe you know, hire a consultant to look at a little more specifics as to how it will be laid out and you know there may be some vernal pool wetlands up there we need to identify and things like that. Yeah, I'll say right now I'm I'm supportive of moving forward with that and looking at a proposal for funds we could use to do that and I I'd be very interested in open in the. Um, investigating the 62 Harris, the um, schoolhouse is something that the Historical Commission has been working to try to work out ways to potentially protect it. Um, and this could be a win-win for a lot of reasons. It's the you know last old schoolhouse we have in, in town. So um, it, it's potent, quite likely that it will be torn down otherwise. Um, so that would be a, a really wonderful use to see it used for fire. Um, so, yeah, personally, I, I think the report makes it very clear that there's a need um, to pursue a station in North Acton and that we should move forward with looking at how to investigate that. So thank you again for your, your report and for everybody's work on this. You're welcome. And, and thank you for your comments. One of the things we try to do is, is to make the report uh, understandable yeah. to the civilians. <laughs> that the chief and I can talk and we right. know exactly what we're talking about, but we want to make sure that the other people who are making right. some of these key decisions understand it also. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely achieved. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Visual aids are always helpful. Yeah. And in, in District 1 or District 4, where I think I would end up, I figured out I'm in the orange section on the, okay. <laughs> you know, on the far each other, practically in Concord, but you know, hey, we, we, we don't have very many incidents there, so, so maybe I'm lucky, knock on wood, or maybe I should move. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Joan, go ahead. Thank you for the report. It's very clear and concise, and having served on the board 40 years ago, um, I was interested in the North Acton Fire Station then, so I hope we can move ahead <laughs> now. Because <laughs> I also Thank live you. up in that area. I know, we have to bucket brigade or something like that. Okay, Peter? Uh, I just had a question about the ladder truck, Chief. I, I, I mean, we only have one high rise that I'm aware of that's Avalon, which is probably too high for the ladder even to get up. But does that respond to all structure fires? Um, I see the engines go out on EMS. I assume the ladder truck doesn't go out on emergency calls. But do, do you need the ladder for a uh, regular two-story colonial fire? Do you use that for that? Sure, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, people look at, at the ladder truck as the 100 foot ladder that's on top of it, um, but that's not what the truck is all about. It's, it's actually the functions that it, it performs. They carry, you know, probably 115, 120 feet of ground ladders that they can use on the two story houses to, to access the upper floors, the roof. Um, you know, the people in the truck company, they're responsible for search and rescue. They're responsible for, uh, for ventilation, for forcible entry. You know, we try to ladder all four sides of the building. So you yeah, having at least one, if not more ladders on every structure fire is, is very very, very important to the overall fire suppression effort. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ching Sung, any questions? Uh, no, Katie asked the two questions I was going to ask. Okay, um, I'll just quickly. Um, I had a question. It's I don't know either either you, Mr. Finley, or the chief will know. Um, there was a reference. I, this was really impressive to me because there was a, a, 
a, an extended explanation of the fact that some of the data that you were collecting might be skewed because, say, things were reported as emergencies when actually they were inspections or they were non-emergency actions, and so there needed to be differentiation, and you didn't know how it might collectively affect your projections. But I, I was wondering, one, is it, was, was there likely to be, were the numbers such that they would have an impact on your projections um, regarding emergency reports, all the data, or is it, were they really seemingly a, a small proportion of the total numbers? I just didn't know. No, I, I think, again, working with the chief and the fire department and also the GIS personnel, um, we were able to basically scrub out the vast majority of the non-emergency stuff. So that 12,494 that we came up with are actual emergency incidents um, that, that, you know, emanate it from a 911 call or whatever, as opposed to some of the other non-emergency stuff. See, and if you hadn't carefully explained that in, I wouldn't have even asked about it. So, I mean, I was glad to see that. Um, and then I just have, I, I have some other, some, I have one question that has to do with something in the report, and I think that there, it maybe is supposed to be, um, there's a word change. I don't know if if you have an email, I could send it to you or give it to the town manager to, to send to the chief to send to you. Um, but I, I just wondered if, it, because I understand that your aim is to have a higher percentage with lower response time. And I think that in the context, anyhow, um, I think that there was, there was, anyhow, there was a word that I thought should be different. It okay. should be, it should be, it should be, uh, six minutes or less as opposed to six minutes or more. Anyhow, it was a pie chart. It was one of the pie chart things. Anyhow, I can, I can oh, send it to okay. the town manager and he can forward it, but it's just, I want to make sure that if, it's, it, if it is incorrect that it gets sort of fixed so that people aren't relying on it. And the sure. only other thing I would like to add, um, this isn't so much a concern for you, but it has to do with uh, a lot of people in town have been hearing about the Harris Street, Street property, which we only recently acquired, even though uh, the process for acquiring it took quite a number of years in discussions with the state, but um, people will know that um, um, I think that the, the Natural Resources Department and Recreation Department sort of had eyes on, or the cemetery department had eyes on the storage shed in the back, and, and I don't know how, you know, if we can have a fire station and have the storage in the back, or if the storage would have to be somewhere else, but there were some, we got a question um, from somebody who's on the cemetery commission asking about the fact that there had been funds from the, the cemetery, cemetery funds used, uh, allocated, toward the acquisition of the property for that purpose. And, and actually, the town manager clarified that the funds were not cemetery funds, they were general funds. So again, this is not something of concern to you, but it was just I wanted to straighten that out for people who thought that it was cemetery funds that were um, being real were, had been allocated for purchase of that property, including this big storage building, and now the possibility of having a fire station that would that could conceivably change that plan. Um, okay, audience. What, one what? thing, if I could just um, add one thing onto my yep. comment uh, to answer Mr. Burry. Um, you know, one of the things about the ladder truck also is all of the new construction today that's being built is what's called lightweight construction. The, the homes that were built in this area, um, you know, you can have a significant fire in them, and, and while they can certainly collapse, the risk is much less than the stuff today. I grew up in a home that was 100 years old. That home, that home could burn much, much longer than the home I live in today that was built in 2001. So that causes us not to be able to do some of the things we used to, like put firefighters on the roof for ventilation and that sort of thing. So it's more imperative than ever that we have the, the aerial device to be able to allow them, even on a one or two story building, to work from the safety of that aerial ladder. Any follow-up? No? Okay. Um, sure. Audience members. Chair Fredericks, West Acton. Um, first of all, I like the idea of the reuse idea. I don't oppose that uh, Harris Street site. I think it's a wonderful site. Um, and I think that we need a fire station to ser serve North Acton. Uh, I think we should have been doing it a long time ago, as Joan had said. Um, uh, I'd like to know how many towns around us meet the four minutes, 100 percent. So I don't know if that's you, Caitlin, or whatever. Well, first, first of all, the the 
benchmark is, is 90%, and I don't know, you would have to um, do some type of a, a survey among them to see if they would report uh, what their compliance percentage is. I don't have the answer to what percentage is around Acton because that was not part of that study. Then I have a question about that may not may not be answered here, but um, the extra minute to get to where the wheels are rolling, um, I want to know if that extra minute had changed when we centralized the dispatch. What the standard uh, recommends is that from the time the 911 dispatcher picks up the telephone until they dispatch the call should be approximately one minute. Okay? From the time the dispatch is completed until the firefighters are on the apparatus, the ambulance, the fire truck, whatever, and rolling out the door should be about another minute. EMS calls, they say a minute. I think they actually just raised it to about a minute and 20 seconds for fire calls because they have to don their uh, fire gear and that sort of thing. Um, so that has been pretty consistent over the years, and that's how they arrive at the six minutes from the time that the 911 call is answered till trying to get the first unit on location. Thank you. When we were talking about centralizing the dispatch, that whether it would impact that roll time was a question. I'd also like to mention that um, historically, at least when I moved here, the fire department was volunteer, I believe. Wasn't it volunteer up until the 1964. late? 1964. Oh, I moved here in 1974 and there was still. We abolished the, the call department in 85. But... They had the horns that would ring and then the guy across the street, I forget his name, he would get up and, and go down to West Acton and that was an extra roll time, I suppose. Um, and then my last comment was um, just something that was sort of offhand and sort of as we evolve as a society, um, it was the use of the word civilians to refer to, I guess, us. Um, I think that we're all civilians, including our esteemed fire chief. Um, I don't think we have any military employed by the town of Acton. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Miller, 84 Windsor Avenue. Um, first of all, I think the north um, area is an area of need, and uh, this seems like a good idea. Hare Street seems like a great idea. I know the uh, 2A and um, 27 site was a challenge some years ago, and so I, I support this entirely. Uh, but I do have a, question, have a caution uh, that I want to raise if you think about this, or maybe it's already been th thought about. Um, particularly as you think about the old facilities that you've outlined in the report, I read it earlier today, um, and particularly the central station, which is low ceilings and tight space. Um, and although um, obviously the recommendation is to try and move the ladder truck there, that seems to be the most difficult site to upgrade, I would think. It's an historical district. Um, it may present some special challenges that need to be weighed against um, the other stations, and I know the comment about not closing anything for 10 years, you really, once you make a decision about one thing, it leads to decisions about other things. And certainly if you upgrade the central station uh, for a ladder truck, that sort of drives the decision about eliminating either the west or south Acton station. Um, and so when I th think about planning, there's a sort of a, a bimodal decision. The north station is a clear need. The question is, what do you do with the, all the other locations and the capital costs? and requirements for those other locations. I think there's more study needs to be done. I didn't hear a discussion about the projected increased elderly population that uh, I'm hearing about in terms of new construction in uh, 27 and 111. And then earlier tonight we heard about Kmart changes, which is a whole bunch of new units. How is that? So using five-year historical data, when I already know or hear about significant changes and things going forward may not be the best solution. Um, and then the other question is the EMS data versus the fire data. And I, and I didn't see a distinction in the plot plans that were done tonight, but having lived next to the uh, uh, Windsor Avenue elderly population, that the fire truck always arrives with the EMS truck, and it's generally the EMS that's there to pick up somebody. So I don't know how that works in the system, but clearly if you have it, always have EMS requirements 
for elderly that's not driving the fire truck needs. And so that, from a planning of those other facilities, I think should be um, taken into consideration and certainly be questions that will be raised by a lot of people at town meeting when we get there for this. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Clower, I think most of you know me, but I'm going to speak tonight on behalf of this thing because I was on the committee back in 1981 when we did the same study. Nothing has changed except Avalon was not up there. And there's been a lot of changes in building construction and the town just keeps growing. I began here in 1971 working across the street. We went out 228 times during the year. They go out, I don't know, thousands of times now, but we're way past the point where something has to be done. And the other thing is, there were two men in the station from 1964 onward. The only thing that has changed is in 1975, we added an ambulance and added two more men. So nothing has really changed over the years except they've gone from hundreds of calls to thousands. And I don't know how much longer we can get away with this. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anybody else? All right. Well, Mr. Manager, you said that you would like some direction from the board as to uh, authorizing you to kind of look at things in greater detail. Um, and. Uh, I do feel as if you need us to formalize it, or do you feel you've gotten enough input from? I, I always think a, a formal vote is a good thing. Okay, well, does somebody want to make a motion to formally authorize the town manager to pursue um, possibilities, I guess, in North Acton with greater detail? Right. So moved. I should shut up and let other people do the work. I have a anyway. question. <laughs> Yeah, Peter, go ahead. Uh, can we just authorize you to uh, use the money from the Avalon Fund, or do we need a town meeting appropriation to do that? I don't think you need a town meeting appropriation. What I would suggest is, is that we uh, uh, look into uh, consultants, get some prices, come back to the board, and the board can authorize uh, the release of some of that money. Okay. So Katie has moved and Joan is second, and now we've got question. Mr. Clower. Yeah, um, since you know, we, as a cemetery commissioner, we had taken two articles that we were granted money for and combined them to go towards the purchase of this land. Is there some way as this thing moves forward that we could consider the entire facility if we acquire the 62 Harris Street property as well to include storage facilities for all of the uh, equipment that the cemetery department owns, and uh, natural resources that's stored outside. I mean, Bill, that's one of the things I, I wanted to utilize the, you know, that money for to see how it could all work. I, I think it could, particularly if we acquire 62, Harris, that, that storage could still be, still be utilized. I mean, that, my gut's telling me that, but I think we need to look at it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Katie moved and Joan seconded. Is there any more discussion? Or shall we vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. Thank you. And thank you very much for, for a very interesting presentation, very interesting report. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. And, and yeah, it is Philadelphia. <laughs> it's great. Thank no, you. I like Thank it. you very but just much. To, I lived there long enough to pick up on that. I could never, okay. I could never do the accent, but yeah. Okay. Did you live right in Philadelphia? I live. Well, I lived in, in Philly and then and then South Jersey, um, huh. and uh, just. Uh, but it's mostly it's when I go to see my in-laws, you know, because uh, well, the husband he, he passed away, but he he was native. Philadelphia bred and born and he just and he passed it on to his son so okay yeah so well, if you lived in South Jersey I live in Vineland that's that's where home is now so yeah well it's there it's definitely there so <laughs> yeah good for you you're definitely not New Hampshire so <laughs> thank you right. thank you yeah. very much Bye -bye. good night good night we have now um, 
Next on, we have Selectman's Best Business. We have a number of interesting items. And uh, first item up is Acting Carbon Neutrality Initiative, Green Advisory Board. Uh, Peter, you're, you're the liaison to GAB, and I can see at least one GAB person in the audience. Uh, but perhaps you could, we have uh, the three-page letter from the GAB, but maybe you could either summarize yourself or provide an overview of what um, GAB is looking for or suggesting. Uh, or, or you could ask Dennis to do that. <laughs> On June 13th, the uh, town's Green Advisory Board, which is a town board that's established to advise uh, the town on environmental uh, issues, uh, wrote a letter to the Board of Selectmen uh, wanting to assess the potential for the Green Advisory Board to lead the town in establishing the admirable goal of seeking carbon neutrality. Uh, which generally refers to reducing a town's carbon emissions as well as finding ways to sequester the carbon it does emit. And a high level, uh, the GAB sees the uh, steps as follows, uh, understanding the current carbon neutrality landscape, quantifying and documenting Acton's carb uh, current carbon emissions, and uh, secure the expertise of a consultant. The goal of this uh, initiative would be to uh, reduce uh, Acton's uh, carbon emissions, including uh, from private entities as well as the town, uh, to, as I understand it, zero by the uh, year 2050, uh, either by reducing the carbon emitted or recapturing the carbon that's emitted. Uh, the Green Advisory Board estimates that a consultant or a town employee uh, could be retained for 40,000 a year for the next two years to assist with the assessment and help conduct a town stakeholder process to determine the level of support for such a program. Uh, so uh, we put this on the agenda tonight. The letter's included in the uh, packet for the agenda uh, to consider the GAB's request. And Dennis Loria, who's the vice chair of the Green Advisory Board, is here to follow up and give us more details. Uh, and I just ask that we turn it over to Dennis unless there are some more preliminary questions from other board members. You're up, Dennis. Thank you. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I just want to add a few words. I, I don't want to get into a lot of depth and <clears throat> um, the details and try to convince anyone that there's global warming or not. Um, I do want to say that the towns and the schools um, over the past five or six years have done a wonderful job of taking advantage of um, incentive programs available from the Green Communities Act to reduce the amount of energy used by the town and the schools and to increase the amount of clean energy. Excuse me. <clears throat> However, um, last November, a number of us sort of became, I guess we recognized that um, we couldn't, we, no, we, we couldn't, number one, rely on, on the state to achieve um, uh, uh, a lot of um, global reduction goals. Um, and more importantly, we couldn't no longer rely on the federal government to be our environmental stewards. Um, and we felt strongly that we had to take more action as, as individuals and as a community. Um, so we all agreed that we should investigate the uh, potential of the town becoming a net, zero, net carbon zero emission town. Um, a number of towns in Massachusetts uh, have already done this. Uh, several like Lexington and Concord, which are more like Acton in terms of population density and demographics, are steps ahead of us and are, are uh, investigating uh, establishing this initiative. Um, so the money that we re requested would be to help um, fund, uh, goal, fund um, consultants as well as a part-time uh, town employee to do the research that's necessary to number one, as we said in the memo, um, do an assessment of what our current emissions are, and then to establish methods of reducing the net uh, carbon emissions to zero. Um, that would involve, as we see it, a stakeholder process, because we do want to involve both businesses and residents in the town <clears throat> in this overall goal. Um, and so as part of this process, as part, as part of the planning process, we'd come up with a goal. Um, it might be 2050. I, I'd like to see it be much sooner. Um, other towns are establishing goals in 2025, 2030. And it really has to come out of the assessment um, 
in terms of looking at what our emissions are from now, what, what can be done in the near term to, uh, at reasonable cost, uh, reduce those emissions. Um, so I would only add that um, Mothers Out Front and both Green Act in, are both in, in favor of this initiative, and we request your support as well. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Questions? I, you? I guess the only other thing I would mention is there is a green fund that, as I understand it, was set up to uh, put the funds that we uh, saved from the solar array uh, on, the, on the transfer station into an account. There's some restrictions on what that money could be used, but, and it would have to be appropriated, but there's a possibility that, that, that those funds, I don't know if the town manager has more uh, information. Well, first of all, we, we, we passed, uh, uh, the town had uh, uh, had a special act, which was passed by the legislature five years ago, that created the uh, Energy Efficiency Fund. Katie, you probably worked on it when you worked for Jen, actually. Um, but it um, it's there to provide funds for energy savings in town-owned facilities or in town-owned property, or for other energy efficiency, energy conservation, or renewable energy projects or activities in town. So that last kind of phrase I just wrote may qualify. I, I may want to talk to council about that to see if they view that. We have about $123,000 in that fund right now. Uh, that could be a possibility, obviously, if, if, if council doesn't agree with my reading of it. Um, we can do what I know Concord had, a, had an appropriation at their, their past annual town meeting. So either way, we, I think we'll be able to proceed. Um, questions or comments, Peter? Do you have any other comments before I open up to the All press? Right, the I board? don't. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, Katie? Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to thank the Green Advisory Board for doing this preliminary work and, and bringing this request to us. I think it fits very well with our um, short-term goal, our, our number one short-term goal of um, the sustainability policy. I think it ties in well with that, and so I am um, very supportive of moving forward with this. Um, my question to the town manager is if. Um, council does agree and we think we can move forward with using the um, money in the energy efficiency fund. Do we have to wait for a town meeting to appropriate that? Do you do you that? Uh, <laughs> this, this, uh, this legislation allows us to expend without appropriation. The board is likely going to have to approve it. Okay, yeah, so that would be great because I think, you know, waiting until April, um, you know, uh, uh, preferably we could start some of this work earlier. So um, I would like to, you know, suggest that we authorize a town manager to look into um, the possibility of using the, the, the money in that energy efficiency fund and bringing that back to the, to the Board of Selectmen. Um, and then we can sort of, yeah, establish what the next steps are in hiring a consultant and... Uh, getting to work on some of this and I think it's you know helpful the research you've done about what other communities are currently doing um, to give us some of that framework and, and where to go from here but I think it's exciting so thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? Ching Sung? Um, yeah my question was the $40,000 a year was um, for a part-time town employee do we know how much a consultant would be uh, in addition to that or was so, that included in the 40000 Yeah so um, <clears throat> The $40,000 per year for two years is based on what other towns have spent to hire consultants to assist them with this process. So to a certain extent, if we could have, if we have the time um, from a, uh, a, some of the time from an employee and they have the right skills, we could reduce the cost of a consultant. If we have to hire a consultant to do everything, it's going to be 80000 If we can, you know, or if we hire, if we use an employee, we have to obviously pay for part of his time. Yeah, and I just saw in the, uh, the Mass Municipal Association beacon that I think came out today that Concord actually has their, that position advertised, the, the energy efficiency position advertised already. So we can, we can look at that as a model as well. Yeah, they've moved ahead pretty progressively. They're, again, there are several steps ahead of us. And, you know, I've probably if I, I'm anticipating that if we were to establish a goal, um, of a net, becoming a net zero community, then we would want to hire an individual to spend a, a significant amount of time to help us achieve that, that goal. Right now, we're just looking to put together the plan and need the help of consultants and town employees to put together that plan. Anything else, Shing Sung? Or you? Oh, no, I was just curious whether or not that budget item, uh, that cost estimate uh, reflected uh, everything or whether or not, uh, you know, there would be uh, the need to potentially hire additional town staff or something like that. 
think yeah, Dennis answered the not question. Not before the town, no, again, what we'd ultimately come up with would be um, a plan that would become part of a town warrant that would be approved by the town, and then there might be some costs associated with that, and then um, those costs would be part of that plan. Sure, no, no problem. That's fine. I was just wanting to clarify that. That's all. Sure. Joe, questions? No? Okay. Um, I just have uh, one question. Is this, the aim is to include everybody, um, not just, this is not just focused on town buildings or town emissions. It's for everybody, including residents and businesses. Because that was, you know, I, I was trying to look through quickly, and I thought that was the point of this, our approach. I, I get I recall reading something that there are towns that take different approaches and some of them are focusing on, on municipal buildings or municipal facilities first. Uh, so this is, I, I like this approach, I like it to be much more inclusive, so anyhow. And I do remember setting up, setting up that energy efficiency fund a long time ago when I was a liaison to GAB. That was very exciting. How do you, how do you um, establish a fund for savings that you can't quite a, document because you've saved them. Anyhow, that was a big question, so it's nice that it turned out well. All right, if there are no other questions or comments from the board, I'll open it up to the audience. Thank any, you. Th any th you, might have, you might be on, on board still, Dennis, <laughs> if there are questions, thanks. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. I remember interviewing the people for the first GAB when we started it. Um, the question is, is the 120,000 include the solar array savings or was the solar array savings on top of the 120,000? Includes. Okay, and then I personally don't want to wait for a town meeting appropriation and I'm hoping that Steve's got fle the FTE flexibility within the budget to be able to get a part-time person to be working on this ASAP. I don't know if that's too big a question, but uh, but we're looking at whether or not we can use these funds without having to go to town meeting. So uh, that... I, well, okay, so from what I understand with, in, with respect to budget and town finance is that there's um, a budget that's voted on by town meeting. Within that budget, there are a certain number of FTEs that are allocated for various things. Then we were, there's always this sort of, uh, the actuals of whether it's spent or not spent and how many people are hired or not hired, and there was always two or three FTEs that weren't quite hired, and people hadn't been assigned to jobs yet. So I was wondering within the existing budget whether we had that FTE flexibility to assign somebody within budget as opposed to using the 120000 to hire an additional person. No. No, we don't have that. Okay. No, and, and you know, I'm not, it's not clear by this legislation if, if personnel could be hired, because it talks about energy savings, it doesn't talk about personnel, so it's another thing I'd have to talk to council about. All right, thank you. Deborah Symes, Concord Road. I'm just appropriating the mic because I want publicly to thank the Green Advisory Board for taking this step. It's awesome. And I think it both is, um, Katie, I think it was you who said it, it really uh, integrates well with a lot of the other things that are going on in town and, and also honest is like the platform from which many things can unfold because we kind of can't do anything until we know where we are. So I just want to say publicly that I appreciate it. Thanks. And I support it personally, and I dare say I'm on safe ground to say the Green Acton's in support. And there's a reason that this was on our agenda along with uh, our discussion of sustainability goals. Somebody had to plan that, so anyhow, thank you. <laughs> thank you for giving me credit now. <laughs> Any other questions, comments from the audience? All right, well, um, Mr. Manager, do you have a, a sense of where you go next? Okay, um, right, well, I guess with that, we'll just move on to the next agenda item, which is fiscal 18 sewer O&M rates. Mr. Barrett, we might get you out of here at a decent time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening to the board. I'm here to ask for a vote of the sewer commissioners for our FY18 building schematic. I'd like to review some key components of our sewer operations for the board prior to any questions in the vote. Uh, first off, the town has been providing public sewer services for the last 15 years. 
Public sewer service is available in approximately 11% of the town. We have about 655 customers. That's further broken down as 580 residential and 75 commercial. The Acton Boxborough Regional School District is one of our biggest O&M customers, as is the plaza at Kelly's Corner. Uh, next, our operating costs are very stable. We pay approximately $600,000 per year to Wooden and Curran to operate and maintain the treatment plant and collection system. Their contract is in place until 2020. It would be noteworthy that pursuant to cost controls in place, the town manager negotiated the wooden current contract with a CPI escalator clause. We have had small CPI increases the last few years. This has helped to keep costs down. We bill using winter water usage, which eliminates summer activities from the calculation. We get these readings from the Acton Water District. Uh, our water consumption is down due to conservation efforts and the budget is up slightly, which necessitates a slight rate hike of 2.5%. If the board approves this recommendation, uh, this will result in an FY18 annual bill to a single family residence of $793. This is up slightly from $774 in FY17. Uh, are there any questions before the board votes? Board members, Katie. Sure. So it sounds like the the increase is really due to the sort of increase in usage or, or decrease in water conservation efforts, and I'm wondering if we can kind of make that um, clear to to users in some way, just so people understand. You know, I mean. Uh, I, I think financial uh, incentives or disincentives are a lot of times what actually drives people to to conserve. So um, I, I would hope that um, when we, if and when we do this, that we uh, kind of make it clear to users um, that your water usage and, and your conservation or lack thereof has uh, an impact um, on on your rates. Um, so that was my thought. Yeah, we. Uh We'll, I believe we put a little comment or a filler in with that, with the bill commenting okay. on what, how the rate comes about. But yeah, absolutely, the, you know, the more water you use, the, the, the higher your bill will be. And uh, you know, overall, the, 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 the we're pretty stabilized now, overall, the, the water usage and consumption, it's been coming down you know, year over year, but at some point things kind of level off. You know, because we're a stable system and we don't have a lot of new hookups now, but we, we will make that clear. Okay. Yeah, and I think part of it's the peer pressure, right? So people know that if they use less water, their rate or their their total bill is down. But just you know, making it clear, obviously, that if your neighbors are using a lot, it's going to affect your rate. So if you can, you know, peer pressure your everybody near you uh, to, to to conserve as much as possible, um, that sometimes helps. But otherwise, I, I think it's reasonable. And as you note in your memo, um, we've kept the the um, rates are reduced them for the last five years. So it's not as though this is um, a recurring thing. Anybody else? Peter. Uh, 15 years is actually starting to get on a little bit, I guess. I assume you have a uh, capital uh, repair set aside as part of this budget. Um, but there must also be upgrades in 15 years over the way sewer treatment gets done and uh, what's the useful life of, of the plant and are there any huge capital repair needs or improvements or retrofits that you're looking at in the next few years? So uh, in terms of uh, funds put aside for future repairs or extraordinary events, as the board may remember, uh, a couple of years ago now we kind of sequestered 1.6 million into a sewer stabilization fund. Um, so that, that will definitely help. Um, yeah, 15 years, Peter, we're, we're getting up there. Uh, there's not too many of us left from when we did all that work. Uh, so, but if you look at our audited financial statements, I think what you'll see is the treatment, the, the sewer project, if you think about it, is a couple of different pieces you have, Adam Street, station uh, and then you have the collection system which is the pipes the 
I think you'll see the pipes probably have a 50 year, 35 to 50 year useful life. And down at the treatment plant on Adams Street, you know, we'd have to get Director York or, or bring back uh, Doug Halley for a discussion, but they have these, I think they're batch sequesters, they call them, but um, it's where all the bugs are. And uh, those probably have a 20, 25 year useful life. So, you know, we are getting up there in the age and we, you know, we have a, a you know, a limited capital plan. I know uh, Director York, who now oversees sewers from a day-to-day -day perspective, is looking into that. But, you know, right now, as you say, we're 15 years in. We, we haven't had a ton of problems. But, you know, one of the things we're looking at is that um, the SCADA system, and that's part of the internal controls, like the computer system that runs the plant. You know, that's getting up there. And I think on uh, that system, I think talking to Corey and Brian McMullen, that's a $150,000 replacement when we do have to do that. But again, we have some, sun, uh, some funds set aside in a stabilization fund, and there's a healthy fund balance for the sewer enterprise fund. So I, you know, we're, we're going to keep working to get a capital plan developed, but we're, we're in pretty good shape with, with set-asides. Okay, thank you. I guess the good news is I've only got 15 more years to pay on my bonds to pay off the sewer drives. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's good news, Peter. Anybody questions? Okay. No, I, I remember that um, when you mentioned the stabilization fund, I remember that there was this issue of trying to set aside uh, big chunks of money to cover capital costs. And there was some, I recall there was some issue, and that's, you, the solution was the stabilization fund. I don't know. There was something you couldn't, you had it set aside, but it wasn't set aside separately enough, I don't know what it was, but. Well, t Madam Chair, that, that item was, uh, you know, I think DOR, they had a little bit of an issue with some of the accounting that I had at the time for a capital replacement. I had an account that was set up and the Department of Revenue, and they were actually right, they, they wanted it uh, into a stabilization fund where it was easily votable by the town. They, they were right, and, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the, there was a fund balance reserve for capital reserve. That was how we had it on our records. And DOR said that's fine, but that's not a votable account. And they work with us to, and they recommended a stabilization fund. So now, you know, if we need to go to town meeting to access those funds, we can, we can get them. And if you haven't taken a tour of the wastewater treatment plant, I, I actually recommend it because I did it. And it was very interesting. And at the end, there was a sample. There was clear water. And there was a little cup thing. And, and whoever was leading the tour you know, challenged people who were on the tour to take a sip. And there were no takers. Very nice, anyhow. But it's, it's very interesting. I've also taken a tour of the water treatment plant, the one in North, North Acton, not the new one. So, but I'm a little bit strange. Anyhow, any question, other questions to the board? Okay, audience. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. And I'm really excited about um, when I first started working in public policy. There was very little, um, in my view, consciousness about setting aside for future capital expenditures. And I, I think that we're really, as a society, um, gaining ground in that area uh, all over the country. Um, and so thank you, Steve, for putting that money aside. Um, on an ongoing basis, is a percentage of the budget go into a set aside, or is it only like one-time votes to get specific chunks of money? So when we set the O and M rate, uh, we, we try to equal our cost plus a little bit for capital reserve. So, thank you. So that's what we're trying to do, Tara, <laughs> just a, a little bit. The Government Finance Officers Association thanks you. Um, and what is that percentage, just out of curiosity? Well, it, it varies by year. So it, it's not a set uh, percentage. Um, I could review some of the calcs with you, but the capital reserve right now is probably down to you know, 5% of the total O&M building. It's, it's, it's kind of come down a little okay. bit because we have some money put aside. Thank you. Um, and I had asked you in the hallway, and you didn't know this, so I'm just going to ask these guys in case they know. What is the capacity of unutilized capacity of the sewer system as it stands right now? Does anybody know? Don't know. OK. Um, and then my last 
question is, where does the sewage go? Since we have the sustainability discussion next, um, and we're talking long-term sustainability of the species and the concept of triple bottom line, everything is part of the calculation. You know, for lack of a better term, we have leaching fields down at uh, Adam Street. So we are not discharging into a, you know, river. We, you know, it's like a, you know, a large system that just discharges into its own um, bed, so to speak, oh, down at Adam Street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was my understanding that there were trucks of excess material, as they called it, um, that went to New Hampshire or some other place that... Well, I think, uh, I think sludge is removed. The sludge is removed, yeah. okay. And but there so, is an infiltration system on site, so... Yes, and so I was just curious where that went because of in an environmental justice um, construct, we, we don't want to outcost that to less privileged populations that might be the recipients of the material. I don't know that. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, do we have a motion to approve the proposed rates? Move to approve the FY18 zoo operation and maintenance rates per uh, the memo from Steve Barrett. Second. Katie moves, Ching Sung second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Thank you very much. You may go home. <laughs> Okay, and now for the other part of our environment-related items. Sustainability, sustainability goals implementation discussion. Um, I know, Katie, you've been conferring with Green Acton. There are Green Acton folks here who are going to go. Maybe we should start with, with them, unless, Katie, you have some introductory remarks. But I think um, they have uh, submitted more detailed comments, and they're going to provide us with an overview, which I think will be helpful as we start this discussion of what exactly we want to accomplish with our annual goals on sustainability. Yes, go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jim Snyder Grant, 18 Half Moon Hill. Um, so you've chosen uh, to create a sustainability policy as your top goal for the coming year. And you've asked Green Acton for, for some assistance. I'm the clerk and the co-president of Green Acton, so I'm here to report back with some ideas to help you in crafting a policy. Um, um, as you alluded to, there's a longer version of this background material, which, um, which Lisa was able to print out and is available by the front door. Um, and uh, it's also in your packets. Um, OK, so let's start by reminding ourselves of some of these multiple and intertwined environmental emergencies. Um, first, the shrinking supply of adequate amounts of fresh water. Um, there's a local and regional aspect to this, which you're probably painfully aware of because of events around Nagog Pond and because of the two local Superfund sites, Nuclear Metals and WR Grace, uh, that are sending contaminants into our water supply. Uh, next, climate change. Um, greenhouse gas emissions growing beyond the planet's ability to absorb them. Some important impacts that will hit Acton. Um, average temperatures rising beyond where civilization is used to coping. Uh, sea levels going up. Uh, so you might expect some uh, climate refugees from the Boston area, and increases in extreme weather events such as floods and drought. Uh, third, loss of biodiversity. Species are, are dying off and dying back. Um, this is sometimes called the sixth great extinction by deep historians. Um, next, accumulation of environmental toxins as we create, consume, and discard materials and compounds that can't be reused or recycled, and thus they build up in our air or water or soil or in our tissues. Uh, and finally, uh, at least for this list, uh, human population growth, uh, which amplifies the impact of all of these crises. Um, now, these crises are tied together in many ways, including causes, effects, and strategies uh, for addressing them. They all arise 
from human short-sightedness, I guess I would call it, where we act to create some temporary local gain at the expense of damage to others uh, at the cost of harming the lives of those who arrive in the future. Um, and that's why this work is sometimes called sustainability, to emphasize that our strategies for health, safety, and happiness need to look ahead to make sure we aren't eclipsing these possibilities for future generations. They all tend to create, all these environmental problems tend to create negative consequences first and foremost for those that aren't protected by um, institutional or personal power or privilege. Um, that's why we recommend that this policy should include a call for equity and for explicitly considering the most vulnerable as the most important groups to help in, in these policy moves. Um, all these problems, are made worse by a lack of knowledge and insight. So understanding and measuring the full flow of energy and materials, we know that that takes time and effort. So we'd recommend that the policy should call for measurement, tracking, and, and modeling so we can get a better understanding of what impacts our actions and choices are creating. And that's why your strong move on the net zero proposal from the GAB is, is, is such a wonderful and well-timed move. I think it's one of the first things you need to do along with the, um, the actions proposed by the town meeting um, vote around studying Acton's long-term water supply. Um, all these problems cut through the typical boundaries of human organizations into you know, families and cities and towns and states and countries. So that's why we're suggesting that the policy should include seeking to influence actions beyond the normal locus of town control. So making, making recommendations, making, uh, uh, advocating. Um, dealing with these problems all call for investments that can take a long time to pay off. And, and sometimes the only payoff is avoiding the increasingly expensive harm and cost caused by inaction. So that's why the financial, analysis that's, that, that's the financial analysis that's necessary for any big town decision um, for these sustainability actions, it should consider the long-term consequences of action versus inaction, as well as the indirect costs and benefits to uh, all residents, not only just the municipal operations. And finally, all these uh, problems uh, impact each other. They're not truly separable. That's why actions that work to mitigate more than one of these problems at once should be sought out, and there are plenty. Um, so what belongs in a sustainability policy? Um, here's the questions we asked the Board of Selectmen at the last meeting. Uh, what sort of scope might a sustainability policy include? Um, what's the right level of detail? What's the level of urgency and why? What's the uh, span of control, I think I'd call it? Does the policy cover things that the municipal government can only indirectly influence? Um, now, we're waiting for feedback from the Board of Selectmen before drafting a specific policy for you to consider, but we do have some general recommendations beyond the background that we just gave you. Um, first, you th we think you should explain what sustainability means for Acton um, and indicate what the policy does or doesn't seek to address. Um, second, I think you should focus on process rather than specifics. Um, specific initiatives typically belong in a plan to implement the goals of a policy, and they also change quickly. Uh, we want a policy that can provide some uh, stability, focus, and guidance over the medium term. So we have one process model to suggest. Um, that would be having the town manager submit a report each year detailing the results of sustainability efforts the town has taken on in the last year. Um, include in that report a preliminary list of proposed efforts for the upcoming year. Um, and each year have the board organize some way for the board itself and for all the committees and, and the general public to discuss the uh, report of the town manager in order to sharpen the plans for the upcoming year. And then finally, we think the policy should provide some overall guidance on, on what types of efforts are particularly needed. Um, and we hope we've given you some uh, guidance or ideas on that topic already. Um, 
Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this important work. We look forward to listening to your discussion and coming back with an actual draft. Um, we also look forward to continuing to work with you on having the Acton of the future be a place where our descendants can have a good life. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. Yes, Katie. All right, I'll kick off comments. Um, so thank you again, Jim and Deborah and, and Green Acton for putting together this, uh, uh, these thoughts and, and background materials um, and bringing back the questions you asked us last time. Luckily, it's at closer to nine than 11, so I think it's, <laughs> we're a little sharper. Um, so when thinking about this and, and what you recommended and sort of some of the issues you've brought up, um, personally, I, I think it would be good to see a policy that is um, sort of broader and like you said, doesn't focus on specific, um, specific actions necessarily or very detailed ones because I think, you know, again, we want to make sure it serves us in the long term and I want to make sure, I think it can be the umbrella for supporting a lot of um, ideas or issues that have come up recently and whether that's the carbon neutrality initiative, whether that's things like the tree clearing bylaw or dealing with natural gas. Um, so I think ideally we would have something that really focuses just on recognizing um, the you know, concerns that we have um, with the state of affairs now and talking about how to get to where we want to be or, or that we perhaps kind of the state that we want to be and then having some of those process specifics in there. I think having some sort of tracking uh, mechanism makes sense. We want to make sure that it's not something that, you know, we pass this great policy and then we feel good about it. but we don't really do anything about it. Um, so being able to check in annually on, on where we are. And um, I wonder if that involves a town manager report that, but perhaps we mentioned some of the committees, particularly, you know, Green Advisory Board um, in doing that in consultation with them. Um, so that's, those were sort of my, my general thoughts. Oh, and then uh, the question about whether it should go beyond just things that municipal government can do. Um, it was a little torn in this except that when you know everybody brought forward at our last meeting the the request for us to sign on to the sort of climate mayors things and all of that and and I do think that as was mentioned earlier you know our, our state and to a larger extent our federal government have abdicated a lot of their um, control and um, over these issues and it really is up to us and and I do think it having a broader policy could then give the Board of Selectmen that backing um, for supporting some of this advocacy work. So I think it would help that if we had a policy like this in place where the town has sort of agreed to these general principles, that then say if there's legislation that comes up, um, so whether it's something like Representative Benson's um, um, cap and trade bill or, or other issues like that, that we could potentially take a, a position as a board on that, but knowing that it falls within the policy of the town. And I sort of think about how the League of Women Voters does things like that when they do a study and they have these sort of um, policies and positions that then they can take positions on specific issues that, that fall within those broader um, um, positions. And, and I, I think it would give the, the board sort of that, you know, backing and, and uh, support of the town if, if we had that. So those are, oh, in the level of urgency, um, you know, I think it's worthwhile to, to pursue um, quickly or, you know, and, and now um, it's like you said, I mean, that we're, we really are in a climate emergency and I don't think it's worthwhile to wait. And I think we're moving forward on a lot of these like specific um, proposals or, or um, processes, whether it is the um, carbon neutrality or whether it is looking into a tree clearing bylaw or a natural gas bylaw. And so I, I think ideally we'd have this townwide policy in place and then a lot of these things could more easily fall under that and we can point to that as, as we do these specific initiatives. Um, so I think just because of where, you know, I think a lot of the energy in, in, in a lot of activist groups in the town is moving, it would really make sense to, to do this now. So um, again, overall, just thank you. And those are my general thoughts. <laughs> Board members, other, Peter, go ahead. Thank you. I missed the, uh, I wasn't here for the last meeting, so I miss, missed the initial discussion on this. I just have a couple of quick comments. Um, 
I'm looking at the interconnections and points of leverage, and uh, it seems to me that number 2B, 2 talks about dealing with climate change, and B talks about decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, transitions away from fossil fuels, including oil and natural gas, building fewer new buildings and less new infrastructure that indirectly cause uh, fossil fuel use. Uh, kind of runs up against concepts of uh, economic development in town, um, increasing um, the housing available in town, uh, economic development being intended to uh, build a broader commercial tax break to, uh, base to try to relieve the pressure on the residential tax base. Um, I suppose some of that could be addressed by smart growth in terms of, uh, of greening of new structures and, and uh, using alternative sources of energy rather than, than the, the general fo fossil fuels. But it also uh, seems to be some tension between that goal and number five, recognizing that human population growth is a global issue. And A says we have an ethical obligation to accommodate as best we can those who wish to join our community. So. Um, I certainly think that's a laudable goal. The, the, the draft you produce recognizes that um, the, the, the worst effects of, of uh, climate change and um, the environmental um, problems fall on uh, lower income individuals. And uh, so I think uh, uh, that's a laudable goal, but again, that kind of runs up against the, the con uh, concern for expanding um, the number of buildings and new infrastructure in town. So um, some way we need to find a way to accommodate both of those goals, uh, obviously. Uh, but, but the more I see this uh, proposed initiative and the, and the uh, carbon neutrality initiative, I'm beginning to think we need more resources for personnel in town. It doesn't seem to me that the town manager is going to be able to write reports every year. It's, it's unfair, really, to put on, on our volunteer boards uh, obligations to come up with producing reports. Uh, a staff person who has um, particular expertise in the scientific areas that need to be addressed um, seems to me if we're going to adopt all of these policies and goals that it's leading more and more toward um, increased personnel costs which um, have a dedicated person to deal with the sustainability issues that's that's obviously always a big issue but uh, expanding the employee base but um, if, if we think it's uh, important enough um, I think we may need to get there Jason. Um, so I guess uh, just some some general comments with respect to some of the things that uh, you brought up at the end, uh, respect to sort of um, the direction and scope of the sustainability policy. Um, in general, I agree with a lot of what uh, my fellow board members have said. Um, I do think that it's important to have um, a sort of a broader policy that covers uh, sort of a little bit outside what the direct purview of, uh, of, of our board and, and sort of the town may be. Um, but I also would like that, would like to sort of mention that I think it's important that the policy uh, sort of, I guess, takes a more detailed look at town processes and sort of the, the areas where the town has direct control, because I think those are the areas where um, the town itself is going to be able to have the largest impact on um, on on the kinds of issues that uh, the sustainability policy is designed to address. Um, and so, you know, while I think it's important that um, the policy not preclude us from being able to do things that support initiatives at the state and national level, which uh, I do think that it's important that the policy overall focuses on um, you know, what happens, uh, you know, in the town of Acton, so to speak. Uh, and I guess um, to Peter's comment about uh, uh, sort of the need for additional staff people and whatnot, I think that that's important to think about um, uh, as far as how we do tracking and how we do things like a time frame um, and, and sort of understand um, you know what we're looking at as far as um, as far as how fast we want to move this forward and sort of how in depth we want to be in following um, 
in, in sort of following and, and reviewing um, the work that we're doing. Um, I think that that's an important point of discussion. Uh, my personal view on this is that it's important to have regular updates and review of policy um, because to me a policy that isn't functioning is a policy that is uh, effectively a burden on, uh, on anything that's going on. Um, and so and so I would like to do that without sort of generating a whole lot of need for, um, for a lot of extra staff time if there's a way to do that. Um, so I don't know if that involves sort of maybe a longer reporting period than a year or maybe folding some of the responsibilities for uh, reporting and tracking into the um, responsibilities of another board like the Green Advisory Board or I don't know, uh, depending on uh, what kind of um, review we're doing and may other boards may, and committees may be involved as well. Um, obviously this board will be involved in, 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 in that as well. So, um, you know, that's sort of, I guess, talking about that. Um, in general, I think that, um, like you said, a process-oriented policy um, is the correct way to go about this. Um, talk about how uh, the town of Acton is going to encourage, uh, you know, sustainable growth and development. I don't actually think that um, goals of economic development um, to sort of relieve our um, our. Uh, commercial, uh, residential <laughs> uh, taxpayers of uh, sort of the, the lion's share of the burden um, of, of uh, the tax burden of the town uh, to help out with that. I don't think that's at odds with um, with a sustainable with a sustainability goal. Um, obviously, there's a reason that existing um, infrastructure and technology is as cheap as it is. But I think as uh, I think that uh, the town can definitely um, do things to encourage sustainable development. And I think that that's something that we should look at, um, you know, as, as a policy area for um, some of the things that we can do to, to, to sort of have the best of both worlds, to have new development in town that will accommodate, uh, you know, people who need it, um, have the ability to have new businesses come to town, um, but to have those businesses be, uh, you know, environmentally friendly and environmentally sustainable, and to have those new residences be both affordable and, um, and uh, you know, in, in environmentally friendly. Uh, and I do think that we can develop policies um, to that extent. Um, and so, uh, sort of that, I guess that covers my general comments on sort of the stuff, so. Joan, anything? Yep. Yeah, Friday I met with Ron Beck, chairman of the Water Resource Advisory Committee, and we need some new members, and we hope to be at full staff and get going in early September. And I think that will feed into some of the mm -hmm. issues here. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Aronson and, and uh, his colleagues on the Volunteer Coordinating Committee have uh, the, the new revised charge, so with any luck at all, you'll have uh, new people applying, so uh, yeah, very good. Um, I, I really don't have that much to add, but of course I will talk anyway. Um, but I, I agree that, that the policy should be broad, um, and, and frankly, I was looking at uh, sort of the history of ACTA and, and, and the things that we've done that would fit under, the, should fit under what I sort of see as an umbrella for, for a lot of different um, specific actions. But I think it would be interesting if we could have in the policy, we could have sort of the history sort of bullet points or something with the years and just, just to remind people of the fact that we've been doing these things for quite a long time and this is the sort of thing we're, we're, we're geared toward. Um, it would also be helpful for people who are moving into town I and mean, businesses and all that sort of thing. Um, so that's a scope, pretty broad. Uh, level of detail, well, I think again, you don't want to be too, too specific because you might, you don't want to exclude anything. Uh, the detail is useful once you've 
done something and you want to sort of give yourself credit for it. Um, urgency, I, I assume that's the policy in general. I think that we, we need to act now. We've already been, we've been moving toward this uh, for quite a while, so I think why not um, formalize what we've been doing. Um, span of control, I, I pretty flexible there. I think that it, as Katie, I think it was said, it can involve things where we're perhaps um, advocating as opposed to actually um, managing something hands-on. Um, but uh, I think that Peter raised some points that probably will be more important as we're going forward. One, with regard to personnel, I think um, we're just gonna have to trust that as this progresses, it will become obvious at some point that perhaps we need to add personnel rather than constantly tap into consultants or, or the Green Advisory Board or Green Act and to do a lot of the lifting um, and analysis. Um, but then the other thing is that we need to keep in mind the fact that in being sustainable, it may we may have to accommodate um, points of view, interests that seem to conflict with each other. Um, and Peter did flag the issue of reducing the amount of building or whatever development, but at the same time, we're supposed to accommodate um, people who want to move into town and the town is growing and because the population of the world is growing. Um, and so how we do that, uh, you know, maybe it involves at some point looking at our, our zoning uh, by law and, and sort of saying, okay, we need to encourage smaller, denser um, units. Uh, we can't have this sprawling, you know, 80,000, 100,000 square foot lots with humongous houses on them. Um, we, you know, we need to encourage people to live closer together and so that we can then preserve um, open space, which is beneficial to all. Uh, we are very lucky in having uh, a lot of wonderful open space in the town that was here before I moved here, thanks to the foresight of people, many people, I'm sure. So, uh, and with a robust trail system too, thanks to the Land Stewardship Committee, um, uh, who does yeoman's work. I, I've been trying to encourage my husband to join them because he, he'll be retiring in a few years and he loves to use tools and he's a, a fidgety person. So, and he's, he's also got a technical thing and I told him the LSC is largely guys, <laughs> almost entirely guys at this point, and a lot of them are technical guys. And so, you know, computers and tools, it's just like fantasy, anyhow. Um, but sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I generally, I think that um, this is a good thing for us to do, and, and those are my points. I think that you know, keep it broad, to keep it flexible, and to account for a lot of different things that may kind of percolate up as time goes on, so. Audience members. Tara from West Acton. I'm so happy. I love this discussion. And I love the fact that you guys are like diving into the whole triple bottom line and thinking long term and thinking about the whole concept as of sustainability as opposed to a siloed, like let's just save some LED lights. You're looking at the whole thing. I really love that. Um, first of all, I'd like to, someone had mentioned what is it that we could do when we reach beyond. And I want to give a couple of first uh, examples. Um, Acton often waits for other towns to do things. Uh, for fear of maybe being challenged by developers or challenged by somebody. And I think that we can stretch and be first sometimes. It's our contribution to the wider world is that we have the resources and the privilege to be in a position to be able to think creatively and stretch beyond. Like when we took on the Walker property, um, that set an example for the state and, and a lot of people now are using what we, what we gained. Um, write letters to the state. Um, not just in response to legislation, which I love, and I think it's called the carbon fee, not yeah. cabin trade, but anyways. Um, but for example, the uh, pension fund is one of the largest, 30% uh, of all money on Wall Street is managed by union pension funds, excuse me, union funds, um, largely pension funds. Massachusetts is one of the largest, and uh, we are very heavily invested in fossil fuels and banks that are investing in fossil fuels. So I think that's something that we can take on to at least just write a letter 
send that out to other towns, and then they can start writing letters, and that kind of pressure makes change. Um, I'm totally in support of staff on board. I will make note, though, that the historic folks and the preservation of existing buildings has been waiting for an FTE or half an FTE for, I think it's been almost 10 years now. Um, and the reuse of buildings is significant when it comes to sustainability because when you rehab a window that's made from old growth, it lasts for 100 years. When you buy a brand new window and put it in, it lasts about 10 years. And you can't rehab it because it's just trash. They build, excuse me, they grow the wood so that it's disposable on purpose. So the concept of smart growth, I think we need to um, really examine that relative to whether any growth is actually sustainable, given that we have mansions of buildings that are being heated and lit, that each one could house 10 or 15 families, some of these are so big. Uh, we have over 2,500 apartment units um, on Route 2A that are often being bought every year by cash from people from outside the country that are coming here, not because they have to, not because they're um, poverty stricken and need to, to work someplace local, but because they want to come here. There's a difference between the public necessity, the social obligation of providing for people who can't do it on their own and folks that are coming here because they want to. Um, we could be buying up those units. They're going for an auction, sometimes under $100,000 each. Uh, the two agencies that we currently have in place, God bless them, are for very specific purposes. AHC has under strict uh, government limits as to what they can do. And the ACHC is organized around building, building 40B, middle income, profit oriented. So, uh, or excuse me, can be nonprofit oriented, but they only build for $50,000 a year and more. The people who need housing and a sustainability plan has to include for people who are extremely low income, and we've had virtually no growth in that area. So that's my speech about the FTE and reuse and the historic buildings and doing all the things in our F2020 plan besides just accommodating white people of privilege. Thank you, I'll stop now. Um, now, the conflict of economic development. Um, if we only think in terms of the taxes coming in and out of town hall, it's a very short-sighted discussion that's oriented around capitalism and cooperating with industry. It's a fool's errand. We must think in terms of the overall cost of living, what's going in and out of our pockets, who has money and who doesn't have money, the ability to live here. And for example, if the town used Morrison Farmhouse property for a cooperative and said that a t you know, any entities could go in there and use it as a, as to build cooperatives, to build jobs that are sustainable or local, to uh, help bring forth the, the, the farm's food that's going on around the region, I don't know. I'm, my point is, is that economic development isn't just adding to the tax rolls in the traditional fashion of building new buildings, and um, we need to think beyond that. I think that's it. So uh, thank you. Oh, and also the, um, the more we do reuse and the more that the FTE concentrates on reusing instead of building, um, the carbon footprint of new buildings um, I'm going to be preparing the figures based on the Finland and, and Canadian studies, which dissected the um, carbon footprint um, estimates for building by the EPA, which have been basically provided by industry. Um, they're saying that it could be three, four, five, ten times what those uh, carbon footprint, if you include the in total embodied cost of the growing of the forests and the shipping of the items and the concrete and all of those carbon footprint costs, which I hope are included when we hire a consultant to do that. Nonetheless, um, the rehab and reuse of existing buildings may actually cost us less if we put a price on our carbon footprint as opposed to just looking at dollars going in and out of town hall. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Is it time for us to talk or do we, we need somebody to draft something? <laughs> no, I mean, do you, Deborah and Jim, have a general sense of <laughs> our thoughts and where to go? Good. <laughs> And we're on video, so you can always 
have fun and watch us. Okay, so in next steps, you guys are gonna go back and draft something, and I know you've got a meeting um, that unfortunately can't be at on Wednesday. Wednesday. That's, that's on the gas. That's on gas. I law, right. so. Could, could be on other things, but yeah. So I think you're asking us to go to the next step and draft something for you guys to read, yeah. and that's fine. We'll also be proceeding to work closely with the um, a couple of key committees that uh, should be weighing in on this as we move towards uh, you know actual language. Thank you. And thank you for taking on the drafting. That's you notice notice how deftly we kind of pushed it away from us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is great. Okay. And finally. Um, Discussion on naming rights for the Senior Center and Human Services Facility. Mr. Manager, you probably know more about this. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we've been approached by a, uh, um, a not-for-profit who has done a lot of uh, work for the town and donations to the town and has offered a substantial amount of money for the, uh, the new facility at 30 Sudbury Road, uh, around $100,000, if uh, Naming rights, uh, naming rights would be kind of a requirement for getting that money. Um, we put in your packet a couple things. One was town council's opinion about um, naming rights, and, and, and kind of bottom line, there are two ways to do it. One is to put it out to the highest bidder, or one, if it's a condition of a gift, you can just do it. The only thing you can't do is if you have an existing building that's called uh, you know, the Jones Library or whatever, uh, you can't change that name in exchange for more money, so to speak. Uh, also attached was a policy, and I'm not sure when the board adopted this policy, it was, was prior to my time, but, but it talks about uh, a person living or deceased for whom a town facility may be named uh, must be or have been a resident of the town or may have made a significant contribution to the town. Evidence of the contributions include a dedicated service to the town, uh, persistent efforts uh, to sustain a high quality of life, uh, demonstration of understanding of the essential functions and nature of local government, and providing directly or through a foundation, bequest, or other philanthropic means, extraordinary charitable support for town institutions and facilities. So uh, in, in this case, uh, number four, I think, would be, uh, would be pertinent. Um, uh, the, the individual was asked not to be named at this time. It's just this kind of a general discussion, but I mean, I guess the bottom line is whether the board would be willing to, um, uh, in exchange for naming rights of the, of the new senior center, human service center, um, uh, for hundred thousand dollars. Board members, comments, Katie. Um, sure. So I think that's an extraordinarily generous donation, and, and I would uh, certainly be open to to this. My only question is, it's um, uh, we're leasing the building, and so have you discussed with the person that's donating this? Does the name go with the building, or does it go? I mean, hopefully we'll be there for more no, than ten right, years. But if we move and build a new senior center, does that senior center carry the name? Well, we haven't had this. I mean, specifically. It, it would be used for some equipment, exercise equipment, some other, other equipment in there. I did not have that specific discussion with the individual. I, I can have that. Uh, I suspect, obviously, he knows we're leasing it, so it can't stay with the building if we're not there. Well, no, not with the building, but I mean, does it stay with us, sort of? So if we build a new senior center, does that name then go with it, or? Um, does it, I, you know, I mean, would there, would then if somebody if wanted to donate money when we were building the new senior center, it could have a different name at that point? Oh, I have that discussion. I, we, that, okay. we did not anticipate that. Yeah, I think that um, once we clarified that, I think, um, but I, otherwise I, I would be, um, I'd, I'd be open, I'd be open to this. Peter? Um, just on the legal points in council's memo, I would say for that amount of money, $100,000, um, we would simply accept that as a gift rather than go through the procurement process and go out for bids to see if we could get a higher. Right, because you could end up calling it like the Einhauser Bush uh, Senior Center. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like the criteria in the, uh, in the policy. I mean, I think we should go through all the criteria and make sure that, that the uh, proposal meets meets the, the standards. 
Anyone else? Ching Sung Joan, either? No? No, it sounds, it sounds fine to me, and I, I have to say the policies, we have a bunch of selectman policies, and I have a whole copy of them, which Christine provided to me because we were going through them one day, and I thought, God, these are a mess. Um, but that was several years ago, when I think before I became chairman the first time, and I didn't have time to deal with it, and now I don't have time to deal with it. But uh, I, will, I, will, I will deal with it before I leave the board. So anyhow, that's a promise. Thanks. Yes. Audience member? Tara yeah. wants to act. And so if, as I understand it, the policy is that, that buildings and other types of town property are not to be named after living people. Is that the current policy? But living or deceased. Living or deceased. Living or deceased. Well, I was curious how uh, Dory Hunter got himself you know, named on a couple of buildings, but nonetheless. Oh, there's no buildings named after him, Tara. Oh, sorry, I thought it was the police station. No, it's a, it's a dedication thing, oh, but it's not, it's not called that. Um, so I don't like the idea of people buying, name, naming, I don't think, I, I don't think that's appropriate. Because um, my first thought was how much does it cost to um, change the name of Acton to Lally Steinberg or something. Um, and then I feel like the discussion about naming rights, if I, I feel like it shouldn't be rights. I think that um, that begs of advertising, which is commercially oriented. And if we're working towards sustainability, I'm not sure that that's a conversation we want to be having right now. But I don't have a problem with a plaque being put up saying thank you to whoever for the, the exercise equipment, or even a room being dedicated to somebody. But I feel like the whole facility, I'm concerned about it, like what Katie was saying, does then they have the right to own or name whatever else they, we, we happen to build. I'm just very leery of that. I feel like public resources are public resources and we're barraged with advertising all around us everywhere we go. You know, the T cars are all now filled with advertising, you know, cars, trucks, everything's named. And I feel like this is sort of holy ground, our senior center and I object to it. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Miller, Windsor Avenue. I would disagree with Tara. I think if you had $100,000 coming into you and you just had a discussion about trying to hire FTEs to take care of all the sustainability thing, I think the taxpayers would act and be furious if you hired people but then walked away from $100,000. Thank you. Uh, Danny Factor, 11 Davis Road. Um, I also have great misgivings about the idea of naming a, a public building uh, after a private person. In particular, this is going to be a building that is going to focus on uh, human services, and I don't at all like, you know, the message um, that, um, you know, money is what uh, buys these kinds of naming rights when, you know, this is a building that is, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, the principle, you know, that you know, every single person uh, deserves um, uh, the same services. Thank you. I, I would just point out that um, the question to council was about naming rights to rooms. At the senior center, it wasn't the whole building, but um, obviously the, maybe the principle still applies, so, in, in what you've expressed, so thank you. I just want to clarify, I wasn't talking about walking away from $100,000. $100, what I was saying is that feel free to donate the $100,000, $100, let's accept the $100,000, but by, as soon as we start providing advantages to people because they have an extraordinary amount of money, I think we're losing sight of what public service and public infrastructure is about. It's about equal. If you said, hey, let's put their names in a hat or let's put it all out for everybody to vote on who's most important or something like that, I'm, I would be more in favor of that than to just offer it as a cash sale. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure that getting a name attached to a room is a, a benefit, a real benefit. And I have, you know, there are people when you give to your alma mater, there are people who give huge chunks of money anonymously. There are other people who say, huh, if I'm going to give $10 million, I want my name emblazoned. <laughs> you know, I want it on the side of the building or whatever. So people have different ways of wanting recognition for their generosity. So, um, and some people don't want any and would be happy to remain anonymous and other people want something, would prefer to have recognition. So, yes, Charlie. Charlie Aronson, and I want to state that I'm in favor of putting a name on uh, a room or the building to give recognition, especially to somebody who's going to donate $100,000.
And if it's a nonprofit organization, it's not like it's a commercial statement. It's something where we support them and they support us. And I think that mutual cooperation is very important for Acton. Thank you. Ronald McDonald, uh, Taylor Rod, is this? There's, uh, there's the gift is conditional upon the name, namely. Correct. Right. It's a hundred thousand dollars. For if the building is named, correct. We should sell our soul for a hundred thousand dollars. I'm opposed to this suggestion. Anyone else? All right. It's the board's pleasure. Yeah, I still feel like it's acceptable, and again, it's within as long as the criteria of our policy are met. You know, uh, um, as one of the speakers, as Charlie noted, it's not that we're that we're selling the naming rights to, um, or naming this building after a private corporation. Um, it has to in, the person that it's named after has to meet sort of the criteria laid out in this policy, which includes. Um, you know, somebody that's done charitable works for a town or that has, you know, um, dedicated service or, or has provided um, extraordinary charitable support. And this, I think, qualifies as extraordinary charitable support. The um, Council on Aging has been fundraising um, for the, the new facility and has received many, many generous donations from residents, some of whom have requested um, acknowledgement and some of whom have been anonymous. As Janet points out, people have different um, you know, requirements or, or desires when they make donations. Um, and I think through that, they've raised like eight or $10,000 so far, which is a, a wonderful amount that we've received from, from residents and businesses, but um, far uh, falls far below what, what they're trying to, to raise for this building and what we need to be able to support all of the people that we want to support in this building. And if somebody's willing to step forward and make a donation of the size, I'm, I'm comfortable. Um, recognizing them publicly and, and naming a building after that as long as they meet some of the, the criteria in this in this policy. Um, so I'm comfortable moving forward with that. Anybody else? Peter? Uh, I am liaison to the Council on Aging. They have a board meeting on August 7th. I'm just wondering, I don't know if you've, you've gotten any input from the director at all. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if the board, um, sh we should wait. Okay, and I'm not sure we have actually all the details. It might be good for the manager to put together a memo that kind of talks to these criteria and explains in detail exactly what the name is and who it, where it's coming from. I mean, everybody seems to know, but I, I don't know if we're going <laughs> into the actual yeah, details no, I, of it. So, um, uh, I could ask the board to put it on their agenda if the, if the selectmen feel that's appropriate and um, give us feedback on, on, on whether they agree with the idea or not. I mean, I, th I think that the, the board, if, you know, if the board is comfortable voting tonight, we can vote. I mean, the COA ultimately has, I, I think they maybe call the shots. I really don't know how it works, but um, I saw some reference to, uh, maybe it's in this memo about the COA having to vote on the issue as well, but or somewhere. I saw yeah, I don't, I don't think what happened they was um, I, I had heard from about this from, from Steve and uh, I put it in my selectman's report. Um, no, maybe, okay. I wasn't able to go to the Council on Aging meeting last in July, but Marion Maxwell sends out regular bulletins about stuff that's happening with the senior center. And she picked up on that in her bulletin and mentioned that I, I had said there was a um, an offer to name the senior center for, you know, a donation of hundred thousand dollars. So. Okay. So the question, is, I think it's at the end of council. So the question is whether it should be, the question. Well, the question whether it should be undertaken is a policy question for the COA in the first instance and ultimately the selectmen. So, um, okay. so we both, we both have to weigh in on it. And I don't know if if it, we necessarily as the board have to wait for the COA. I mean, if the COA knows that the board is weighed in and is one way or the other, then it I may mean, help their the, conversation. The town, the town is leasing the building, not the yeah. COA. It yeah. also contains other town departments. Yeah. So I think it's a little different distinction. But. 
But the so COA hasn't said, see, I was under the impression the COA had said they were supportive of this, but I, I They I haven't considered have, it. They, uh, they didn't have right it under the agenda. Okay. They haven't yeah. discussed it yet. So I think it may be it worthwhile to make sure that they're comfortable with it as well. But as a general policy, I'm comfortable with it. But for this building, so I do you want to sense. people okay. want to hold off on yeah. voting until we, the COA has had a chance to vote on it? Um, that's up. That's up to you, I guess. I mean, I'm com I'm comfortable with the proposal as well. You're comfortable voting tonight? You saying? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Either okay. way, I'm I'm okay with that. I'll still ask the COA to put it on their agenda. Okay. Even though it's probably not necessarily required but well it would be good it would be I mean, good to have at, their input at, at, at some point the board will have to accept the gift so tonight you're not accepting anything oh, okay. it's more of a it's a policy policy <laughs> okay right all right so we just want to i'll just move that we support the general concept and is that what we're Seven. doing tonight <laughs> okay peter is moving and who's second okay joan okay peter move Joan second. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? And last item, consent agenda. Item seven, accept gift recreation department, um, gift totaling $400 from Stop and Shop for the purchase of food items for the Independence Day celebration. Item eight, gift for the recreation department, gifts totaling $1,000 from Anonymous and the Steinberg Valley Charitable Foundation for a classical concert on June 22, 2017. Item nine, accept gifts, recreation department, gifts totaling $350 from Joseph Perry Plumbing and Heating and Visiting Angels to support the 2017 summer concert series and special events. Item 10, accept gift, recreation department, gift totaling $500 from Kistler and Knapp Builders for funding a new recreation facility and playground at Jones Field. Item 11, accept gifts, council on aging, uh, multiple gifts totaling $4,025 to be used toward building furnishings at the new senior center. Item 12, committee appointment, John Capetta, associate to full member planning board. Item 13, accept meet meeting minutes, April 24, May 5, 15, 24, June 5, 19, 2017. I would just note, I sent, sent some changes to Lisa about the seconding on some motions because I never move or second when I'm chairman. So anyhow. And item 14, request to dispose of obsolete items, act in Memorial Library. Move to approve consent agenda items 7 through 14. Is there a second? Second. Katie moves and Peter seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. Is there a move to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Uh, Katie moves and Ching Sung seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. Thank you.